Hi, uh, AJ Hartley here, novelist, Shakespeare professor, baby metal fan. And um, next up in my song by song discussion would be Brand New Day, but I'm taking a break um, from that. I will be doing it. Um, but uh, today I thought, since people have responded pretty positively to me having guests um, on, I thought that I would use the opportunity of the recent um, live streamed um, uh, Budokan show to talk to uh, Stephen Chen. So that's what this will be, a sort of general conversation about the uh, current state of the band, what they're doing, what they might do in the future, and it's all sort of speculative and subjective, and I hope you enjoy it. And that's all. Thanks. Let me start by introducing you. So, okay. um, welcome. Uh, Stephen Chen, also known as Funny Toss. Uh, baby metal fans will know him for his, his fan art and particularly for his work with Capable Paramedic on a number of translations of interviews in various magazines. And uh, you just did a spot on the Baby Metal podcast, which I thought was really interesting. We talked a lot okay. about um, the sort of the variables and the limitations of translation and the, the difficulties of navigating, you know, cultural differences. Um, we may get to some of that, but obviously since we, you just talked about that, I don't want you to have to repeat yourself. So um, maybe just to sort of kick off, you and I have corresponded a little, but we've never actually met in nope. digital space. You are currently in Taiwan, right? That's correct. And, and it's it, what eight o'clock in the in the evening you just come in from work uh yeah yeah i came back home just you know finished dinner washing the dishes and uh now i'm here okay yep. and, and i just got out <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah slightly different head spaces perhaps but uh, yeah. we will see so the, you know we we had talked a little bit about things that we might do together some some sort of conversation or conversations that we might have and as you know, I've been sort of working through the the Metal Galaxy album song by song and um, thought, well, you know, rather than wait till we're done with that, maybe we jump in and have a sort of general chat now and see if stuff came up that we could um, stick up on the site and see if people enjoyed it. And yeah, then, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and then, uh, you know, we were given the kind of softball to swing at, which is the, the live stream of the uh, of the Budokan show uh, from Saturday. So at least in my head, I thought, well, you know, maybe using that as an anchor to, to talk about some general issues about uh, baby metal and where they are and where they are going or might be going or might, might not be going, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, so, sure. so let's maybe let's start there. What were your sort of general impressions of, of the show? Hmm. I mean, well, I mean, first of all, I, it was, it was the, actually, I consider it my first, um, baby metal show actually. Um, cause I joined the fan, you know, I became a fan last year. And so mm -hmm. at that point, I mean, yeah, they've been performing. That was, uh, I joined around, let's say February or March or so. So legend metal galaxy, <clears throat> um, was already done that point and they were doing their, uh, I think U S and Europe tour. So, but after that, you know, then the pandemic struck and they've never performed live since. Um, so yeah, it's basically the first new material um, aside from Rock Mechan mm -hmm. that I've seen. And I think it, you know, that's a lot of time to build up hype and anticipation. And so what I have to say is that it, uh, the fact that I was not disappointed at all um, in any way, despite all the build up and anticipation from obsessing over the group over the past year, I think says a lot about how well <clears throat> executed um, the entire thing was um, and I think that's partly because I think they had a pretty clear vision um, for what they wanted to do um, with these shows and yeah it, and, and it shows um, in, in their work yeah so, I think <clears throat> yeah what, what do you think that vision was so um, just in case you know not all your listeners are uh, familiar um, with the format of the 10 baby middle years shows I'll probably just go you know, I'll go over it at the, here again at this point. They had 10 shows at the Nippon Budokan, and the format of the shows was basically similar um, every single time. Uh, they always they performed 13 songs um, every single show, 
And 10 of the songs were from the so-called 10 Baby Metal Years um, album, which is basically a best of album over the past 10 years. And then there would be an opening song, uh, either a version of Baby Metal Death or In the Name Of, and then two songs that would swap out and rotate. And so <clears throat> for most of the, the for most of the shows, the majority of the songs were consistent and the same. And most of the songs from the best of album were from their earlier albums, actually. I think there was only um, Distortion and Papaya that were from Metal Galaxy, you know, so yep. two out of 10. And the other ones were all from the earlier albums. And so that's why I say my general impression um, of the shows uh, and what they're going for is it was a look back, a retrospective celebration um, of the past 10 years but combined with a few special things, um, nothing new per se, nothing you know, from a undisclosed fourth album, no new music, mm -hmm. nothing groundbreaking in terms of, let's say, unmasking the commies or uh, announcing Momoko as the third member, nothing, nothing mm -hmm. new in that regard. Um, but you know, a, basically they brought back some old songs, you know, some crowd favorites uh, that we might have not expected to see anymore, um, especially mm -hmm. solos, you know, like you know, GJ um, or Onidai Dai Saksen but they brought a grown up twist um, to these old uh, songs and the exploration. Or, you know, they performed Doki Doki Morning uh, pretty regularly, you know, over the 10 shows. And well, that's interesting because for that song in particular, I think Sue performed it very childlike. Um, so I wouldn't consider that, you know, a reinterpretation actually, but that's the exception. But basically, yeah, they, uh, based on the set list and how they did things, it just feels like, you know, you've been doing something as a kid and then you grow up and now let's say, I, I like to draw fan art, as you know. And so sometimes mm. what I like to do is I go back and look at a piece of work that I drew maybe, you know, five years ago. And then I want to redraw it and see how it looks different or how I've improved um, mm. over the five years. And so that's the feeling I got, you know. Oh, you know, there's no new songs and everything. And, and some of them are familiar and some of them haven't been seen for a long time. But whatever it was that he did, it was a, I don't want to say new and improved per se, uh, because people will, you know, think, well, is it better without Yui ever? Is it possible? You know, you don't know. But yeah. as much as they could, um, I would consider it a reinterpretation or a, a goodbye, possibly, uh, to some of the old songs that they might not ever do again. And so in that regard, I think they did a very good job um, of yeah. just showing us a new twist. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good way of thinking about it. I, I, I you know, even with Doki Doki Morning, I rewatched it uh, yesterday. Uh -huh. And you're right, she, she played it as uh, in this sort of, in some ways, even more childlike way than they used to do it. The, the, oh, yeah. The, yeah. To me, the whole thing had kind of inverted commas around it, you know, that, that, that she was playing a version of her former self, you know? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good way to put it, yeah. yeah. It, it became almost ironic, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. That it wasn't an adult version, it was a sort of hyper childlike version played by a mature woman you know which made yeah. it sort of as you said nostalgic playful very much a kind of a sort of self-conscious retrospective and i think another reason why i say this is how i interpret the shows is because they also talked about um the 10 middle years album i think in i don't remember which interview it is um at this point but basically in an interview with uh, sue and moa they talked about the album and because the albums, yes, it's been remastered, but it's not been re-recorded. So they did not re-record it with their new grown up voices. It was a remastering of the old album. So yeah. you used to on it and so on and so forth. So basically, yes, it's been remastered, but it pretty much sounds largely identical mm. um, to the original ones. Maybe I just have crappy speakers, but I can't really hear the difference very mm. much. Mm. Um, but the girls themselves, they mentioned that um, it was very nostalgic um, for them to listen to the best of album because they normally don't actually listen to the studio tracks. Um, I'm guessing that's because when they're doing rehearsals or wherever, because they do change things up during live shows, mm -hmm. you know, with different timings or whatever. So I'm imagining when they're rehearsing, they're actually listening to other live recordings and syncing the timings and, you know, call and response with those. So <clears throat> something I think it was Moa or either Sue, one of them said that basically, there's something very nostalgic about this, the best of album and the studio tracks because it's the only way in which you will ever hear this cutesy voice, um, this cute version of him anymore. What was Sue trying to do in the way that she's saying Doki Doki Morning? Is she trying to sing it cute or is she cosplaying as herself as a kid 
or is it right. or is it not you know is she, try, is she trying to imitate her old self or is it is she not thinking of her own self she's just trying to put a cute take on it without the old suit in mind you know we don't know but these are all yeah. those are the things i was going through in my mind on a, on a meta perspective yeah and and uh, you know as i've you know my my riff on this is that i, I care and i don't care what they're intending you know, the, sure. the, I, I always, my, my, I, in the end, I'm like, well, here's what it means to us. <laughs> you know, right. it, here's how I'm receiving it. And therefore, I'm constructing meaning that is not necessarily about their intent. And I don't, I'm fine with that. Because, um, you it's know, it's a kind of curiosity that can only add to it, um, but I can never right. really take away from it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I you know, I think whenever and the interviews are really helpful in this respect as well, they're always about adding levels of meaning. Right. And, and possibility rather than insisting on a single reading. Right. You know what right. I mean? I think, the, yeah. Yeah. And uh, Oba himself has mentioned this explicitly. Um, he mm -hmm. said that, you know, I don't really like to explain things too clearly. We live in an age where everyone wants to answer spoon fed to them. And I like to keep things mysterious just because um, I'm guess. Okay. So I'm just going to go on. It's not really a tangent, but I'm, you, you must be familiar with Calvin Hobbes, right? And like, come on, mm -hmm. a cultured man as yourself. Um, so, I have I have the entire collection, you know, of Calvin and Hobbes as you know as a '90s kid myself. And one of the commentaries that Bill Watterson talks about is the so-called noodle incident. Um, it's referenced many times um, throughout the strip, and it's always, you know, hyped up to be something absolutely crazy and horrible and the craziest thing ever. And Calvin keeps talking about he, he's I was framed and whatever. And Bill Watterson says I I never wanted to explain it. I never will explain it. Because whatever things you guys come up with will be crazier than what I have in mind. Hmm. Um, so I think that's part of the mystery um, that Koba wants to leave it. Like he'll explain stuff if he has to, but at the same he also says, so this is my explanation of so-and-so song and whatever and so forth. But this is just one way to see it. Yeah. I, you know, it's so, the so-called uh, death of the author, I'm sure you're very familiar with too. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I've talked about, I talked about this a number of times on my videos and, and Right. I'll always get comments of people saying, yes, but such and such somebody says it's about this. Therefore, it's about this. Like, no, well, no that's not how it right. goes. Yeah. But, you know, it's funny. I, there's a, I was thinking about this the other day, and I think partly after hearing you talking about the translation stuff on the, mm -hmm. on the Baby Metal podcast, um, I, th I think that there's an element of the fact that the songs are in Japanese, that people want to be able to translate them to get some kind of clear linear sense of meaning, which you would not expect from a song in English. That when That's you true. actually listen to most rock songs, they are frequently sort of collections of images and, and it, it, it's not a clear sort of narrative. It's not, a, you know, the things that are evocative, things that you, some things that you get, some things that you don't get. Most of the songs that I listen to, you know, unless you, unless it's very sort of narration heavy, you know, story heavy, like, I don't know, country music or something. Sure. I turned my, I flipped my pickup truck and the dog died or something. I, yes. <laughs> right? Well, but if you do something backwards, his dog comes back to life, his wife comes back to life. Right? There you go, his right. Car, there's a big down, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but but I mean, with with most sort of rock music, it doesn't do that. You know, it's much more elusive in its in its lyrics. And if you look at them, they're always open to interpretation and misinterpretation and construction. And, and I think we sort of forget that when we switch into a foreign language and say we we must somehow turn this into something very clear and straightforward, which is just not how art works. That's that 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 is a, a good point. Um, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about it um, from that perspective, but that makes sense. I'm not as familiar with uh, metal um, per mm -hmm. se, so I don't know if this is something common to metal. Like I know that some metal songs have themes and stuff, and some are just you know screaming about death or whatever. Um, <laughs> I, I, but I'd imagine that I think my, my interpretation of let's say you know let's say American fans of an English rock band or whatever, when they look at, let's say, the lyrics or the meaning of a song, they're more likely to go into the so-called meta meaning of the song and not just the lyrical meaning. Mm. Um, whereas a lot of fans of, let's say, you know, baby metal or, you know, foreign language ones, they might look up the translations of the lyrics. And after that, though, they might be satisfied with it. And OK, now I know what it means. Right. Whereas for an English song, after reading the lyrics, they already think, all right, well, that's not enough. I need to learn no. more about how yeah. the song was made and what people were thinking and what's the context of this 
people understand it. Whereas where Bebe Lam, part of it is because it's not so easy to understand the foreign context, but yeah. there's definitely more to but, it um, than that's found in the lyrics, even though, of course, as you've done wonderfully <laughs> throughout the rest of the series, there is a lot to unpack in the lyrics for the most part. Yeah, and, and I think that sense of, you know, if it's an English song, um, then it's complex in certain ways. If it's a Japanese song, then it's complex because it's foreign. We therefore right, we right. translate it into English and suddenly it becomes clear. But it's like, but that assumes that everybody who's a native English speaker is also an expert on understanding songs written in their own language. And if that was the case, we would all ace every English class we ever took. Right. right. <laughs> or musicology of, class say, or whatever. Movies, like, you know, like how many people uh, watched Starship Troopers, you know, the first time back in the 90s and thought, you know, and it totally went over their heads about yeah. what it was, it was going for with the satire of Nazism and, and all that, you know, they thought it was just a dumb movie or, or whatever, or it was approving of, you know, fascism, you know, so yeah. even if something's in English and in your culture or whatever, you can still totally miss it at the same time, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I really uh, struggled with band. that movie, I'll be honest with you, because I knew what <laughs> oh, really? it was trying to do, but the very fact that so many people misunderstood it meant to me that the movie uh, hadn't been successful. Do you know what I mean? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, okay, well, then, then again, um, it's a movie that looks a lot better, like, 20 years afterwards. Now, mm. more and more people appreciate it. Maybe it was right. just ahead of its time, you know? Right, right, right. Which does yeah. happen. Yeah. Yeah. And this happens with, of course, with music as well, right? I, I, I've, I think I've talked about before the instance of, I saw an interview of Sting um, of the police being asked what his least successful song was. And he said, every breath you take, huh. which was one of their biggest oh, massive hits. Songs, number one. Yeah. And, and the interviewer was like, what? And he's like, yeah, because, you know, the song was really successful and we were really pleased. And then I started getting all these letters from people saying, this is our song. We're having it played at our wedding. Yeah. It's the story of our relationship. He's like, wait, no, this is supposed to be a song about a stalker. Stalker song. It's the, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he's like, so in a sense, the song failed. Mm. I mean, some people he got express it. express what he wanted to say yeah. or something like that. Or, yeah. yeah. So anyway, meanwhile, back with uh, back with our, our, our show. So yeah, I noticed that you, you said you talked a lot about the suggestions of, of the end of an era, right? The the shows were full of that rhetoric of endings and closure and, sure. and change. Um, and you know, one of the ones that really struck me was the, the a number of references to the endless rain, hmm. um, which uh, of course, is the ex Japan song, which Baby Metal uh, did effectively a sort of co cover of during the, the New Year Kohaku um, performance with Yoshiki, the, 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 the writer, uh, and, and the, you know, the, that piano, right, that they keep coming back to the piano image. Um, but they kept saying that there's no such thing as an endless rain, which I thought was really right. interesting and that we've been through this period of tragedy, but the implication is that now we're moving out of it. And, and I kept thinking in the context also of the Kohaku performance, that that period of endless rain was supposed to be in some ways about the pandemic, right? Because th they were talking mm -hmm. a number of times, they talked about how, you know, the, the, the metal voices thing, the fact that we can't shout and cheer at the concerts and, and all that kind of stuff. So it seemed framed in terms of this sort of global period of, of, of loss and struggle and mourning that was coming to an end, sort of. But I also wondered if it was supposed to be a sort of subliminal thing about moving on from the change in the group that you know so much of recent baby metal stuff has been dominated by people to is yui coming back and and uh you know the the mourning for for mikio uh fujioka and I, I i found myself thinking are they trying to say we have to stop now and either either just stop or or move beyond that into something new. And this is a sort of official, you know, mourning for that period on the understanding that that period is now ending. Do you know what I mean? Yes, yes. Um, I, that's pretty much, you know, as we always say, you know, only the Fox God knows, but that's <laughs> how I would interpret it um, as well. I've always um, considered 
Metal Galaxy, yes, it's kind of experimental in a sense, but in the other sense, I, I consider it a trans transitional um, album. It's yeah. not, in many ways, it doesn't feel like a complete album in a sense because it doesn't have a clear goal beyond exploration. Exploration is cool and all that, but it's oftentimes framed as a process towards a goal. But we haven't seen what the goal is. And of course, this is a, you know, this is a story. At the end of the day, it's a band playing music. So there might not actually be a concrete end goal. Like there might be in a story. But it didn't seem like they were specifically trying to take us anywhere. It felt more like mm. they were trying to take us away from something instead. But where we're going, only the Fox kind of knows. Because you know? yeah. they talked about how they, you know, on Baby Metal, they were just kind of just doing whatever and seeing what sticks because they never even thought they would even make a second, second album right it was just kind right. of well let's just do this and it might be fun and then with metal resistance it was kind of like oh wow this is this is kind of blowing up well you know what let's show people what we, what we have let's do a legit metal album and they did that and then you know afterwards they had the tragedies of mikio and you know yui's departure and all that at the same time um you know interviews are talking about oh you know we, they realized that they'd become bound by the framework of Baby Metal itself, you know, a structure of this is what Baby Metal should look like has already appeared, whether in their minds or the audience's minds. And so they wanted to break free from that for various reasons. Maybe it's because, you know, they uh, tied that kind of connection with Mikio or Yui and that was painful and they wanted to break from that or they wanted to explore new um, creative outlets, you know, mm -hmm. and so the way I've always seen Metal Galaxy is that it's just a way for them to demonstrate that we can do a completely different kind of style of music, and yet you will still recognize it yeah. as, you know, as our music, you know, yeah. somehow, and you will enjoy it. Yeah. And by doing this, they've demonstrated that there is no distinct baby metal sound or right. image or style. Anything goes. And so after doing this, this isn't the destination per se this is just setting you up for the next journey where we're allowed to do anything we want and it, it helps to press you know reset on people's expectations of what might happen all we can expect is that we can't predict anything i think mm -hmm. that's a very important med medical um of the album besides being fun and awesome you know in of itself so i agree that the whole show and the way they ended it and everything like that felt like a goodbye um, to the previous era, for better or for worse. Like, for example, I'd be very surprised if, let's say, in their next, you know, concert appearance in 2022, they're still wearing the exact same costumes mm -hmm. and they're doing things in the exact same way as they did, you know, before. You know, I'd mm -hmm. be, yeah, I'd actually expect them to have something like, let's say, a new third member or unmasked commies or coming out with a new song, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's just we, obviously we have to talk about those things. But just before we do, I, I, just to piggyback on what you're saying, because I mean, at least in in one or two of the interviews that I think you translated recently, there was uh, I think it was Moa saying she wants the fans to embrace the new baby metal and where they are headed, rather than constantly mm -hmm. living in the past. That's an, an overly negative way of putting it, but you know what I mean, right? There's yeah, yeah. something well, I'll to that effect. slightly, just, to, just so we don't slander poor Moa here. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, way, the way she put it was more dip diplomatic. Um, of course. Perfect idol as she, um, <laughs> basically, though, she was talking about different. the more, not just the dark side era, but it calls the metal galaxy. It's talking about, you know, fans at shows and at the time, Sometimes she could feel like even though they were standing there on the stage, it felt like the fans were looking through them or they're looking at someone who was not there. Mm -hmm. And she says, well, that's as a performer, that's sad, partly because you're not enjoying the show as fully as, you know, we wish you could. And that, 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 that's a shame on your end. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we want we, we don't want you to be missing out on a good you know, performance. Sure. And I think that happens. That definitely happens. You know, we're preoccupied with what's not there. And only with hindsight, do we realize how good it's that, you know, everyone's going to have that hole in their hearts. But regardless, mm -hmm. you know, you're not if you're not enjoying it for what it is, you are missing out more than someone, for example, new fans. And she said that during the 2018 tour, there was a feeling of dis-ease, you know, from old fans who were expecting something different. But they also talked about because they traveled to many locations, especially more rural places in the US, that had never seen the group before. And she said that for many first time fans, 
they had a blast mm-hmm. because they didn't expect you know three members with pigtails it was their first time so four yeah. people you know with hair down doing dark stuff awesome you know and they yeah. had, and they yeah. had a blast so yeah i i thought that you know that <clears throat> in the in the baby metal death in the concert that we just mm-hmm. saw handled it in a really interesting way that you got yeah. those images of yui a number of shots from behind mm-hmm. you know you see the, the the three girls up together but you're looking at them from behind they were in black and white so it had that kind of old news really kind of mm-hmm. pastness you know what i mean a sort of visual yeah, yeah. representation of something from from the past so it's an acknowledgement but at the same time as you've been saying there's a sense of of closure of completeness and you know i think i get that feeling more from karate actually um go on how well okay so first of all the reason why i don't think like yes this might have been part of their attention with you know they, they had official and they call it bay metal scene you know so new bay metal death yeah. or whatever yeah. The reason why I don't think that was a primary intention of that is because the images just went by way too fast, <laughs> you know, so it'd be very hard to catch, let's say, clear glimpses of Yui in their past, even though, you know, eagle eyed fans will observe, hey, that's, that's Yui, even though it's like, you know, three milliseconds, but we're, you know, we're, we know them well enough that we know that image is her. But in contrast, let's say at the Rock Mekan show or wherever, they did a lot of, um, on back screens, they had scenes from the past. Um, oh, yeah. They also had scenes from the past. And, and notably for karate, the scene where they're pulling up, you know, the, the third girl, they, on, the, on the screen, they would have footage of Yui um, right. at the time, oftentimes in black and white. So that's, I think that's a much clearer indication of that than they male death. <laughs> okay, now. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, 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 it seems to me, I mean, that, that it's doing something similar. And it raises, it comes back to that question that that you raised a second ago about, it, you know, moving forward, assuming that they are moving forward. And I, I saw a lot of fan panic after the live stream about Spending all this sort all of, that. yeah, all this sort of rhetoric of endings and closure, and you know, and and people genuinely thinking, is is this it? Are we done? And I. I don't think that's the case. I, I, I've heard some speculation that when they reach a certain age, that'll be the end, you know, because that's sort of common in, in Japanese idol music. When, when Sue turns 29, that'll be the end, as if they can't. And I, I hope that's not the case, because I hope that we have kind of, you know, the band has transcended a lot of that sort of idol uh, music culture stuff they've broken right. so many of those rules already i don't know why you would adhere to something like that but I, it does raise questions it you know they're still very much functioning as a three-piece is it time mm-hmm. for momoko to become part of baby metal which bizarrely right. she isn't right i think you know out of context I would, I can definitely see where people are coming from, where, oh my God, this is the end. They're talking about mm-hmm. disbanding, you know, out of context. But by in context, I mean, <laughs> they've done this, they've done this like many times, actually. Yeah. You know, Legend, I, I think Legend Z or wherever it was, they talked about, you know, it sounded a lot like they were disbanding. You know, actually the fans didn't even know that they were continuing at that point, I think, you know, and so for those who have obsessed over baby metal history, you kind of realize, well, this, I'm not, I'm not saying they're not going to span, but, you know, the, this rhetoric has been used, you know, mm-hmm. many times. And I guess yep. Kobe was a fan of it for various reasons. <laughs> so I wouldn't read too She's much. Such a into drama it. queen. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't <laughs> read too much into it um, one way or the other. But you did bring up an interesting point um, regarding the whole three piece thing. Like, I think for various reasons, I, I would, ex- I still would expect them to maintain a three piece kind of formation primarily, um, even into, I, w- I wouldn't say the next album per se, but the next set of shows, mm. if only because all their choreography from the past shows is designed around three people. And unless they're going to ditch all their old songs and never perform them again, yeah. you kind of, you know, they, like they're going to perform Ekitsune again. They're going to keep on performing, you know, Gimme Chocolate and Crowd Favorites. And in that regard, the three-person formation tends to work the best, visually speaking. Yeah. Um, 
So I, I think that that's a big consideration that makes it hard for them to break away, away from it. I don't think there's any reason why they have to go to a four person or yeah. a two person um, formation. I've I've caution, I've spoken out against I think a true duo um, because a true duo in which both Moa and Sue are seen as completely equals in terms of portion mm -hmm. doesn't work very well. Partly because you know Moa's voice isn't at the same level as, of, as Sue's. And Sue, if she had to dance at the same intensity, mm. she would have to tone down the down the dan her singing in order to dance at an active level. And so basically yeah. you're getting the worst of both sides um, in a sense. So I don't yeah. think that's what they'd want to do. They might do some special stuff like, you know, let's say uh, a song that doesn't require very strong vocals, like let's say a version of Onodari Dai Saksen, which is mostly just yelling, right? It's not really like a tones per se that you need to worry about. They could do something like a, you know, a duo Mm. Sue and Moa kind of back and forth, or or GJ, for example, doesn't really need you to sing per se, and they could probably do something like that. But I wouldn't expect it to be the standard format, you know, for the entire yeah. next album. Yeah, I, that I would th be kind of odd. That Sue and Moa's functions within the group are so different. Right, right. That they, I don't think that a duo format works. A lot of us, you know, I'm more familiar with the international fan base, of course, being mm. one myself. And so a lot of us interpret and view the band through our own cultural lenses um, and our bias. And mm -hmm. at least for Western bands in particular, um, you know, most people when they watch, let's say, and I, I, I like to watch some reaction videos on, on YouTube, and most of the time they're going to see a Sue, the one with the microphone, as the, the lead or the main person or, or so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And at, to a certain level, she is. Um, but I don't think it's a perfect um analog or analogy to the western equivalent like in, in the western equivalent, we always as she's talked about they talk about this you know in japanese shows when the crowd chants along with them yeah. they chant the ayanote with mo and yui yeah they, they don't sing along with the lead singer yeah but in western bands they sing along with the main melody with the lead singer whereas japanese fans are like Dude, we're here to hear them, her sing, not you. Why yeah, do you guys sing yeah. together with, you know, with her? So I think yeah. that speaks slightly to a difference in how we interpret things. And so even if she is the quote unquote main person, even in the Japanese context, baby metal would have been good, you know, just with Sue, but they would never have gotten to levels that they had without the unique roles that Moa and Yui played in yeah. doing and, and, something that no one else actually actually does. So it's not I, a perfect I, I comparison. Don't, yeah. I don't disagree yeah. with anything that, that I, th I yeah. and, and I think you're absolutely right. I don't want to reduce Moa to a backing vocalist. That's that's not it. All I'm yeah. saying is I don't think that if it's just the two of them mm -hmm. trying to somehow do something in balance, I don't think that mm -hmm. works. I think the triangle yeah. formulation is, is when she's got two people to bounce off, and and this is why for me, I would I would say yeah, it's time to say Momoko is part of Baby Metal. And turn yeah, her damn sure. microphone on. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, it... ex, ex, spe yeah. Speaking of that, though, like, <laughs> you know, as I was saying earlier about the Metal Galaxy era and album being in transition, I feel like the reason why I can say that and that it's, it's just one step towards a bigger journey is that they are, they were changing, you know, during the band, not just in Absolutely. terms of what material they did, you know, there's a lot more Moa Moa vocals on the album compared to the previous albums. Like she had less noticeable inotes. Um, for people who don't know, inotes are like you know sore sore or soya stuff like that. Yelling, you know, the so-called scream and dance. That she had more scream um, when Yui was around. But if you listen carefully to the background, the backing vocals of Metal Galaxy, um, Moa has a lot more harmonies. I mean, she's not played live. That's backtrack. But she has a lot more vocal harmonies um, with Sue. So in a sense, she actually sings more on the album um, mm. than she did in her earlier days. And would she sing even more than that, you know, as a duet, you know, A, B, A, B, back and forth on the fourth album, it's actually possible. Like in terms of trajectory, that's the logical thing that mm. we could see. In terms of Momoko, I, I think I'm not really bound to any one particular girl per se. Like it could be Momoko or it could be not. Maybe she doesn't want to do it. Yeah. The problem with, I think, following a, such a unique band like this, especially for girls who are largely teenagers um, for their time you know, in the band, is that there are considerations that generally don't exist um, for most Western bands, at least, not pop artists, bands that are already established in at least in their mid to late 20s, because that's when they start blowing up. 
right? Mm -hmm. Like there's so many considerations, like, you know, uh, they're still in school, like in high school, that affected their schedule and how long mm -hmm. they could perform and all that. So let's say Momoko, you know, she had a good time. She loves being a sport dancer, but for how various old is reasons, she? she's, I think, um, 18. Right. So she may very well say, you know what? I love showbiz, but look, I'm one injury away from being unemployable. So mm -hmm. I want to get my college degree first, you know, mm -hmm. just in case. And that's, you know, that's a very common, relatively common thing for people to do, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's unthinkable in the context of just the band itself, where someone is good at it and enjoys it and why she's not, not performing to the extent that she could. And then the answer is, well, in real life, um, she's busy with school. Mm. It's, you know, it, it brings you back to real life. We forget that, you know, these are kids. I mean, not so much for Mo and Sue anymore. But I'm saying there's more considerations overall that may affect their decision making that tend to be less common um, in Western bands where everyone's an adult and stuff like that. Yeah. So I, I wonder also if, you know, as we, this is all wild speculation, of course. Right. Sure. sure. Um, if, as the, say the band is going to continue say that what we've seen as you suggest is the end of an era and we're approaching some some new age some new era of baby metal it would be interesting to see sue and moa and possibly a third member mm -hmm. have more of a hand in creative control yes you yes know? i would agree because they're they're now at that age, and, and mm -hmm. that would be a really interesting way to develop to, to push further away from the idol model. Yeah. You know, to give them a little bit more um, agency within shaping what it is that they're interested in doing. With you know, as you said, different kinds of music or or, or songwriting or something like that. I would personally mm -hmm. love to see that. Well, I mean, speaking of you know more conventional rock band format. Um, as a huge weeb, uh, per, to, to use the uh, academic term. Um, so uh, I, um, uh, I, I watched, uh, there was the, new, the newest and final movie of the Ruroni Kenshin, you know, live action series. And uh, one of my favorite Japanese bands, um, One OK Rock, um, they play, or One O'Clock, uh, you know, they play the, the theme song, I think, for all of these movies. And so I went down a rabbit hole of you know one o'clock songs and all that and you know they do a lot of they're they're also they were what well, they were they're also part of the muse um mm -hmm. sans bay metal um, but they do a lot of like let's say behind the scenes or or, or videos their newest song actually they co-wrote with ed sheeran and so they actually <laughs> did a yeah a behind the scenes documentary of the lead singer taka you know going to you know to ed and then doing this song and you see it come together in, in real time and all that and it's really fascinating it's great and it makes you appreciate you know the hard work that goes behind creating these songs and you know and all of that and so of course while watching that but the first thing that comes to mind is damn i wish you know they would do that you know so you can appreciate what they do behind the scenes but at the same time you know something that struck me is that well you know what look one of, like one of K Rock, like these are guys in their 30s, but baby metal haven't been able to talk about, let's say, songwriting or this and that because they haven't, they were literally children for yeah. most of baby metal's history. They were unable to participate on the behind the scenes and the creation of things to the extent that some other bands can who were already adults when they began. Um, but at the same time, I actually do think that we are going to continue to see. I don't want to say we will see more involvement. We will continue to see it because I'm already seeing um, traces or hints of them taking more agency over creation. And I think it's more obvious in Metal Galaxy, not just because you know that's they were literally adults, 20 years of the adulthood um, in Japan, not 18 as it is in the mm -hmm. States. When it comes to choreography um, in particular, in the early days, you know, Koba would basically give me, you know, Mikiko Sensei a idea. Okay, I need you to cross here, you know, or I need you to do a head bang here because it's a very metal thing, you know, and he'd teach them choreography moves or things that he wants to see in the choreo because they knew nothing about it and he had to at least have some metal elements in it, right. you know. That's what Mikiko Sensei, I, I translated a 2013 interview um, in Hedoban, whatever, recently, and she talked about that. But as time went on, you saw less and less influence or direction um, from Koba. Like Koba talks about, let's say, formulating the guitars for a brand new day and, you know, contacting Polyphia to play on it. But I highly, highly doubt that he had anything to do 
with the choreography um, for the song. Yeah. And while you know we, I you know I believe Mikiko Sensei is an absolute genius in that regard. I also doubt that she 100% choreographed and designed the entire thing and every single piece of movement or expression or stuff like that, like she would in the early days. In the early days, she would tell them, "All right, at this point, I want you to do a surprised face. At yeah. this point, I need to do a serious face, like in Doki Doki Morning." But I'm guessing, I'm very confident in saying that for a lot of the songs on the newest album, I'm guessing the girls had much more input into how to yeah. do a song. Or even they had made it very, very well have choreographed a lot of the parts themselves or just go with the flow and see if it looks good, you know. So yeah, there are, I, I think you're right in that, in that regard. Yeah, I, 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 my guess is that you're right. And that's partly about, you know, them evolving as artists. And when right. I've worked with choreographers, I've, I've worked at, at Charlotte Ballet uh, ah. a couple of years ago. Um, and I mean, it's not, not the first time I've worked with choreographers, but it's fascinating to see how much uh, is actually basically improved right. by dancers when you're doing sort of modern dance in particular mm -hmm. um, under the sort of watchful gaze of a choreographer who then makes adjustments and redirects and shapes things. But a lot of those dancers are, are generating stuff out of their own bodies exactly in response to the music and in, in response to general direction rather than being reduced to sort of marionettes and move like this and stand over here and raise this hand you know that's not how it works yeah yeah you, you know how i know uh, you're a professor because i was thinking the word puppet and you said the word marionette so <laughs> yeah. but actually yeah. that's a very good point and that i want i want to bring that back to the 10 uh, the budokan show actually because I was fascinated by the choreography um, of the shows because in a way, yes, you know, this is all the stuff we've seen before and yet it's so very different at times because so they, they've adjusted the choreography as they've, as they've gotten older and as the support dancers have come in, they, it, it's always slightly different depending on who's dancing. Mm. Um, but for example, for Headbanger, originally they have a whole X shape jumping in the sky and all that. They, they, they do twice during the song, but the modern choreography, they only do it once. The first time they just go, hey, hey, and, and the second time they start dan dancing up and down. So people often use that as an example to saying, you know, baby metal's toning down the choreography. They're not as energetic or whatever as they were before as children. And to a certain extent, that's true. But on the other hand, like, you know, we say, oh, Moa is conserving her energy. She's going, she's, she's going for a more elegant route mm -hmm. now. But that's not entirely true because for mm. certain songs and certain choreography, she actually just goes, you know, all, all out in for like pure energy. For like some of this from fan cams, so we can't see completely clearly. But for like BMC or whatever, like she does a whole up and down like head banging movement that goes even beyond what Momoko does. Or mm. during IDZ, as she's bouncing her foot on the ground, she actually adds a body banging with that. That wasn't, I was actually more energetic than it was as a kid. Mm -hmm. So I don't actually think it's because, well, now she's in her early 20s, she doesn't literally have the same energy she has as a child. Of course, there's no replacement for childish energy and joy on stage. Like, you're only going to be kids once. You cannot reproduce that energy. But I feel like she's more consciously, instead of going 100% all the way, she's trying to create, in her mind at least, a better performance in which there are ups and downs. When you're fully <clears throat> energetic all the time, it feels less energetic overall. You got to have your moments of, you know, quiet for the moments of action to spring out. And so I feel like it's an intentional choice of hers not to go 100% in terms of intensity and force all the time, because then it feels weaker as opposed mm. to going graceful and then force, you know, there's no contrast. I, I, yeah, I, I would totally agree. And, and I think one of the things that I was noticing in this show is that sometimes the choreographer feels looser I, hmm. and by that i don't mean less accurate mm -hmm. i mean that there's less obvious effort going into mm. it and, and okay. i think that that's a mark of maturity and professionalism there's a there's a great italian <laughs> great italian renaissance word called sprezzatura and sprezzatura mm. is the ability it's such a great word it means the ability to pass off as natural what is actually studied yeah do you know what i mean something nice. this sort of ease graceful but you know that a ton of work has gone into it but mm -hmm. it looks completely spontaneous and yeah. I, and to me that's where they are now 
Moa in particular. That the, 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 so. it's got that sort of, and and there are little little glimpses where you feel like she's almost improving between steps. Mm -hmm. You know, because she's so comfortable in her own body and she knows what she's doing, that it's just got that easy grace to it. You know. Uh, again, like I keep this is great because whenever you 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 know we talk, I'm constantly reminded of more and more things that I I read or whatever and so on and so forth. But I'm reminded of the fact that there was an interview, you know, that was conducted, you know, late last year um, after these shows were announced, but before they occurred. And they're talking about, you know, congratulations, you know, you're going to be doing 10 shows at the Budokan, you know, what are your expectations, what are your hopes, and so on and so forth. And they were, you know, Mo was saying that, and Mo and Sue actually both said that, well, Sue said the first time at the Budokan, like, she was so, you know, nervous and preoccupied and everything that she couldn't remember it and stuff like, like that. Like, she, she was focused on executing the show perfectly um, mm. and didn't have time to enjoy herself, mm. you know, and Moa, of course, didn't have a good time at the Budokan, she said she was traumatized by it because, you know, she heard herself running, you know, face planting in IDZ. And so she said a goal for her at the Budokan was just to enjoy herself, you know, mm -hmm. and from what we've seen, that's definitely the case. And so, yeah, there's definitely, I agree with your interpretation that it's looser in a sense because they don't have to worry about making the move correctly. They're going to do it correctly. Now it's just an issue of what kind of style, what kind of twist, you know, I want to add to it spontaneously. You know, yeah, I'm reminded yeah. of, yeah, it's when you're, you got to be familiar enough with something in order to start making it your own in a sense like at first this song wasn't theirs this song or this dance wasn't theirs this song was miko's and they right. were just executing it but now right. after performing it for 10 years it's become there this is mine this yeah. is the, the interpretation of it you know yeah. so that's yeah. something that we see as they become you know older and as they re-perform um older songs they've made it their own in a sense yeah. they're very comfortable wearing this thing it's not a imposter syndrome per se yeah i i th and i think that this sort of feeds into this, this idea of their own evolution as artists and transitioning away from the sort of the, the younger kind of feel of what mm. baby metal were and one sure. of the songs that nobody seems to talk about and i'm kind of baffled by it is their their function on kingslayer the um, bring oh, me the oh, horizon yeah, yeah. song which to yeah. me was a kind of earth shattering shift in the kind of music that baby metal were making and i realized that it's not their song that they're merely sort of a featured artist on somebody else's song but mm -hmm. that's a totally different kind of song from yeah. anything baby metal have ever done lyrically it's a this is a seriously adult sound you know and and, it's, and it, it made me sit up and think so it's like, so it's like completely yeah. different and and we don't have a lot of new material yeah. beyond metal galaxy but if kingslayer is an indication mm -hmm. of where they're going night and day mm -hmm. total shift i think uh i was I, I can't remember i was talking about this with someone earlier before like with the whole you know end of an air and the new beginning what kind of things might we expect to see in terms of speculation i would feel like okay so one of the reasons why I feel Kingslayer felt so different and yet familiar, like in a sense, people have joked that this is baby metal featuring, you know, Bring Me the Horizon, because they could, they could say, aside from the lyrics and all that, like, you know, aside from the swears and all that, it could very well be a baby metal song, you know, in terms of they, they gave Sue a lot to sing and all that. But in terms of styles, I think that reflects the fact that people aren't surprised or they're accepting of whatever style Bay Metal does. Like they would accept this as a Bay Metal song. It doesn't, you know, have to have double bass drums and all that. It can have screams, it can have whatever, and it's gonna be, it's gonna, it's gonna work. And so if you think, if you listen to Sue's voice on that song, her voice was um, pitched high. It was actually higher yeah. than her normal voice. And it was auto-tuned to have yeah. that effect, that electronic effect. Compressed. Um, yeah. And that's something that they wouldn't have done, I think, in the early days, because they had to worry about ex establishing their street, their street cred, you know, you know, people talk about, well, they're not going to do anime songs because they don't want to be typecast as a Japanese band that does anime songs. And so they avoid doing those things. But mm. like if Kingslayer is an indication, they're not afraid of doing these things that they might have been before. Like, I wouldn't actually, I would, I would not be surprised if let's say, you know, next year, they do an anime theme song because they want to, because it's fun. Right. And they don't have to worry about, well, I can't do this even though I want to, because it's going to make me look weird. 
I've yeah. already established who I am at this point. I don't, I don't have to worry about what others think of me. I can do whatever I want now. And so I can do that. I can do an anime song without being rejected by the metal community saying you're not real metal anymore. You know? yeah. So it gives yeah. them more creative freedom to do weird stuff like an electronic sounding voice and high pitched voice on Kingslayer and people listen to it. It sounds different, but no, that's the big metal we know, we know and love somehow, you know? Yeah, so it's, I, very, and I, it's very liberating. Right, exactly. And I would love to see, you know, as I said, that's that's a very dark, very adult, very mature song. And and yeah. Baby Metal kind of get away with it because their section of the song, their part of the song, it is sort of in a little box, right? That that yeah. it that it's kept sent away from, yeah. you know, the, the the you know the 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 the, the swearing, the cursing, cursing lyrics, lyrics and stuff. Um but it's kind of it's kind of compartmentalized in a sense. It, yeah. But it does make you think it would be kind of interesting to see baby metal explore, you know, things that have sort of a darker, more complex kind of uh, emotional range or, and, and more sort of, you know, I, I think they have defined themselves by their positivity. And I think that's part of their, their appeal. But maybe as adults, they don't have to always do that. Maybe we can right, right. sort of explore other things as well. And that would be, to me, that would be very interesting and exciting. I mean, we've seen hints of that, you know, like yeah. I think Shine, uh, Starlight, I'm sorry, Starlight and Rondo as two examples. Sure, Rondo absolutely, yeah. A dark, a dark song, you know, I, I don't think, I feel like Rondo is more experimental at the time just to say like, well, let's see if I can actually do this. Let's see if we can actually yeah. do a song that's not in 4-4 and has dark sure. themed. Yeah. But if they were to do like, you know, a remixed or reborn uh, uh adult version of rondo not that song but a dark song or something like that with minor keys and all that i think that would be amazing you know they, they, yeah. they could definitely do something like that yeah yeah, yeah i think i mean you're right they, they've definitely flirted with those sort of darker elements before but they tend to be fairly abstract lyrically yes you know right. whereas you know a lot of sort of contemporary sort of alternate alternative rock and stuff like that you know whether they're writing sort of relationship songs or political mm -hmm. songs or whatever that there's a, right. a sort of specificity that tends to anchor them in a kind of down and dirty reality you know and that i don't sure. think we've seen from baby Man. right you know a lot of rock bands especially america and they'll talk about politicians and war and presidents and more concrete stuff like mm -hmm. that concrete you know nouns like that yeah and i don't recall anything from a metal song, even from Metal Galaxy, that references anything concrete. No, you know, it's no. more about feelings. Or, yep. I mean, I guess Elevator Girl is technically about an Elevator Girl, but the whole up and down thing is still kind yeah. of abstract. You know, it's Absolutely. not like Lincoln Park. You know, singing about you know kids going off to Iraq and not coming home. You know, what I'm saying it's not nothing as concrete yeah. um, as that. Yeah. yeah, and you know, I don't know. I don't know if they'll ever do anything like that as contemporary or mm, so clearly ref referential. As something like that, I think that's the part that would depend more on Koba. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're they'll be involved with lyrics or songwriting anytime soon. But I think in terms of what vocal twist I have, or basically in terms of how do I want to execute this, mm -hmm. they have a lot mm -hmm. more freedom. But when it comes to stuff like songwriting or composition, I feel like it's very hard for any young person to do that well. It can de definitely be done, but I don't think it's it's very it's a very tall order to ask them to do it to the high standards that they've established so far. Absolutely, yeah, I so agree. I'd be surprised, I yeah. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it, it's inevitable within the fandom, but all our attention is on, first and foremost, Sue and Moa and Yui, sure. and then secondary onto the, the you know, the, the Kami van Kami and so van, on. Yeah. But we don't give anywhere near enough credit to the people, to, to Koba and the other people behind the scenes who build this stuff. Yeah, and who have yeah. driven this sh this engine from from the outset? You know, I, I'm always a bit baffled when I see yeah. people, you know, hating Kobo or whatever. It's <laughs> like you realize none of this would exist yeah. without his involvement, right? Sure. I mean, I think there's legitimate criticism to be said for the way they market things or the way they price things, but in terms of at least as an artist mm. or as a visionary, there's not much to say. I think you know, in people's defense, there hasn't been much let's say interviews or in-depth material translated before until yeah. you know relatively recently i think we're we've only released um three the first three chapters of the koba interview from Karokawa, and then i translated a few more and after that actually i noticed there was a noticeable decrease um in the amount of koba bad 
Cobra Evil mm -hmm. kind of um, talk on Reddit, at least. And on Twitter, it still happens, but depends on, you know, on the crowd or whatever. But I think part of it is just that people didn't really understand, mm -hmm. logically speaking, you know, how much work goes into this kind of thing. You yeah. Know? So after and they understand as, it, as to the, the merchandising thing is yeah. a feature of the Japanese music industry, right? It's not oh, just yes. baby metal. It's like oh, no. all bands produce tons and tons of stuff. And I always think, yeah. and if you don't want to spend the money on it, don't buy it. <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah. That's that's how I see it too. I guess I don't think it's not. This is this isn't what's stopping them from working on new music. You know, it's kind of just a nice to have kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. But I think part yeah. of it is just comparison. You know, I, I think you know I talked about this on the podcast um, as well. And I think that's there. There are both pros um, and cons, if you want to call it that, to um, the band having such wide appeal. Mm. Um, you know, let's say if all the most of the fans, you know, came from a J-pop background or wherever, you know, from watching them at Sakura Gakuin, wherever, there'd be, you know, no complaints about merch because this is how they do things, you know, right. in Japan. You know, they commercialize the crap out of everything. But because, for better and for worse, you know, we've got old metal heads in here, we've got young children here, we've got K-pop fans in here, and everyone brings their own biases and expectations and hopes um, mm. for it you know and for better and for worse a lot of fans that come from you know k-pop in particular like i hate to go over this again i'm not picking on them per se but they're spoiled by how well this is a compliment to korea it's not meant to be a put down on the fans this is a compliment to korea and how well they've done in terms of marketing and to a certain mm. extent you know customer service i guess you give people what they want but that's not the default you know and so when you come yeah. into Pivotal you know, with that expectation you're just like, you know, dude, enough of the boxes, enough of the packing tape. This is all stupid. I want to see backstage photos. I want to see, you know, unscripted interviews. I want to see so on and so forth. And it's natural, I think, you know, to want that because they've seen, you know, well, you know, my favorite band, my favorite K-pop group does that. Why can't they? And mm -hmm. technically, there's no reason they can't, you know. And so they're just like, you know, it's got to be Koba and his controlling uh, dictatorship mm -hmm. that's depriving <laughs> us of this golden material, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I, I get it. But I mean, as you as you suggest, you know, that it's typical in Japanese music for the image of particularly idol singers to be very, very carefully controlled because it's so tied to their fan base. And that the moment yeah. you deviate from what mm -hmm. people expect you to be, your fan base collapses, right? Until you hear all these stories about, you know, somebody was seen drinking or they invited somebody to their hotel room or something and all hell breaks loose and that's the end of the band. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. like it, it's very difficult to separate band behavior from fan expectation in Japan. Right. Well, then, as you said earlier, you know, they, you know they've they've broken a lot of um, unspoken rules mm. about how things are done um, in Japan. What maybe out of luck, maybe out of you know intentions. Like a Western artist, you know, they can basically survive scandals um, mm. a lot better. Right. Than your typical Japanese artist because yeah. the the importance of image and all that isn't as important as it is in the Japanese industry. You know, people in Japan to a certain extent, I think, idols are idols for lack of a better word. Mm. They're not actually real people. They are idealized exactly. people, the best of us. And so yeah. when the best of us that the, that that fantasy is broken, it's hard to remain a fan. Whereas yeah. you know when you were a fan of, I don't know, like. Robert Downey Jr., right? Like you know, you you know him as a person. Yes, you enjoy him as Iron Man, mm -hmm. but you never stop see, re thinking that he is a person. He's an actor who had you know whatever like substance abuse problems or whatever the past. So like, you see him as as a person. So he has got more more freedom to do quote unquote unscripted stuff. Um, and but also because in the U.S. particularly unscripted stuff substance abuse and all the rest of it is rock and roll it's yeah, part of that point. bad boy image right and people kind of like it they like mm -hmm. that sense of of the character the character the persona of the artist to be yeah. sort of edgy to be countercultural, to be subversive right. in certain respects and that's mm -hmm. very not japanese um, you know i'm not as you actually might be more familiar with this um because for 
J-pop, for example, definitely, like you said, that's not the image. But for Japanese heavy metal or Japanese rock, mm. is there a similar, you know, bad boy image, you know, screw the man kind of mentality? Or I don't know. Do you know better I, this? Than this? I, I, I think that, yeah, you know, I was thinking of, a, I was watching a, a piece about um, Hyde. Uh, yeah. the other day and and he was obviously it abroad, you know, in, I, abroad in japan or sorry was it the video by abroad in japan chris broad or oh actually yeah you know i think it was i think it i was. saw that a few weeks ago too well, last week that's myself. funny yeah that's funny. yeah <laughs> it was um, great yeah yeah and 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 he's an interesting case right because he yes. has a lot of those trappings of very american um you know, rock and roll star, you know, and, and versions of that have been around for 30, 40 years. You know, when you go back to sort of the TM network and, and, and those kind of, of bands, obviously, you know, participated in some of that. I think there's a point where to operate outside the lines, you have to be very successful and to have a fan base that's prepared to go with you. And it's very difficult to make that to get to that point where you can do it. I mean, you know, I, I, I've been listening to, you know, Japanese punk um, bands who are very clearly, and, and other sort of indie rock bands who do not play by those idol rules at all and are, yeah. you know, experimenting with all kinds of things that are much more recognizably, you know, Western rock and roll tropes. Um, but, you know, there is no mainstream drug culture in Japan. Right, right. You know, there is, uh, and, and that kind of thing is always going to be incredibly dangerous. So the moment you get close to those kind of things, I think, you know, you risk imploding. I think another way to look at it is that a lot of the quote unquote unscripted or breaking, you know, breaking free the narrative behavior we see on the part of, let's say, Western artists is actually part of the illusion. It's yeah. part of the game. It's kind of like how if you think about it, most black rap music is signed by rich white labels. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of a fantasy um, in a sense. Yes, we're acting out and whatever, but it's actually still within a framework right. of acceptability. This is accepted acting out behavior. You know, maybe we've broadened the outer frame of this thing to make it seem like you have freedom, but you don't actually have freedom. I'm just, you know, I've just increased your your bedtime from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. and now you think you're free. So we, we've been talking for over an hour. So um, <laughs> oh, wow. I'm thinking, yeah, <laughs> right. we should. Is there anything you would like to to close with, or an, an idea, or something that you wanted to talk about that we haven't touched on? Well, I mean, I think you know the, the theme of our little chat today was primarily about you know how we've seen you know baby metal. Um, especially in context of the Budokan and what that might bode, you know, for the future. And I think we just used many words to say only the Fox God knows, and that's cool. Like, you know, um, so I guess, you know, in that overall, to follow that theme, yeah, I think they executed what they wanted to do very well in the Budokan shows in terms of giving a very triumphant and respectful, I think, thank you and goodbye uh, to what they've done in the past. And, it does sound like disbanding if you want to, but yeah, I just see it as just creative freedom. You know, I think that's something very valuable about the group, you know, that they're free in a, to a, at, at a certain level, you know, that's very rare, I think mm -hmm. in entertainment, um, especially, especially when there's so much money involved, you know, people talking about Hollywood films being soulless because they have to make a profit and because they have to cater to the market especially the lowest common denominator, you know, and so, so many films, especially have to cater, let's say to the Chinese market. And so you can't have inside cultural jokes. You got to have spectacle that goes beyond words and barriers and all that. And so you lose a lot of creative, special, you know, there's a lot of soulless stuff, you know, out there and same for music, you know, a lot of artists, they might, they might kill to be in Baymel's position where I'm not beholden, you know, to a record label for this is the kind of music you got to do again because this is what sells. You're obligated to, you know, sell so and so number of albums next year. And in order to do that, you're going to have to give them more of the same, you know, like there's a, a few rare bands that will change up their sound drastically. Like Linkin Park mm -hmm. is a good example. You know, they did, you know, the hunting party and whatever that was pretty poorly received. I mean, in terms of sales and all that, because it was so different from what their fans wanted, their earlier fans uh, wanted. But, 
you know, they, they did it. And that's pretty rare to see because most bands, they got to survive, you mm -hmm. know, and you got to give the market what they want. And to a certain extent, I think being part of a larger group may or may not help in terms of a metal, you know, being part of a, not being a garage band, you know, being part of, you know, a muse or larger conglomerate, maybe they've accumulated enough goodwill or enough profit or whatever that they're given the freedom to try and do something. And that's, that's a pretty rare opportunity, you know? And so I'm very excited, you know, to see and, what and they come I, up with. I next. think you're right that, that, that part of what defines them, I've said this many times, is, is that sort of essential hybridity of mm -hmm. a combination of dis disparate things that shouldn't go together, but somehow manage to go together and work. And, and along with that hybridity is that sense that there's a constant s sense of, of change and evolution. And the albums all have their own sort of distinct characteristics. And there's a lot that they, they share from one album to the next. But, um, but you know, they're built into their DNA is, is change. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully that gives us some new directions to go. Right. And of course, whenever change happens, like it's not going to be for everyone. You know, they've they've lost plenty of fans. You know, over the years, they've hopefully gained more um, than they've lost and all that. But it's it's a natural thing. You know, it's mm -hmm. it happens. You know, to everyone. You never no one stays the same throughout their entire life. You know, you're not going to stay friends with your childhood friends forever. You're going to make new ones. You're going to fall out of touch with other ones. It's it's just how it goes. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. And on that note, maybe we should stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. I think that's that, that's a pretty uh, that was a pretty smooth way to, to sound <laughs> smart and to to, to end. <laughs> All right. Well, Stephen, thank you so much. Um, maybe you yeah. can uh, send me some links to where people can look at your fan art or something like that. Oh and yeah, I can sure, sure. Include them um, in the video or in the description. Uh, right underneath it yeah no problem you know this is this is definitely you know a lot of fun like just it's always fun to see like how many new associations or thoughts and whatnot will appear in your mind as you discuss something in real time with someone else you know you help to bring up a lot of or help me to formulate a lot of more abstract thoughts i had Great. into more concrete you know ideas and that's why I, I you know i had a lot of fun i definitely look forward to doing something again you know sometime when we have a opportunity you know new material or a new impetus to talk about something yeah awesome great man thank you um and uh hopefully we'll we'll talk again soon <laughs>